Let's return to Live from the State Capitol with Fred Dicker here on Talk 1300. Well, James Pinero had a very good article. It was an op-ed in the uh, Daily News yesterday with the headline, It's Time to Free New York's Museums. This has been a sore point for a lot of people over many years. Get this, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is in Central Park, right? It's on... Um, uh, I guess we're giving uh, Jim Panero a buzz right now. It's on. It's part of uh, Central Park. That city land. The city has a, tra- a charter agreement with the Metropolitan, as it does with many other museums in New York. That it's supposed to be a institution open to the public. Let me read a little bit of what James Panera wrote. Here in New York, you can see the greatest cultural treasures for only a penny. It's just too bad more New Yorkers don't know how. In the 19th century, the founding fathers of our city's cultural institutions had the wisdom to ensure their donations went into privately run public institutions. Their generosity created our cities, he means New York City's, unparalleled museums, zoos, and gardens, all in partnership with city government. By locating their institutions on public land, supported in part by public funds, they made them a public good. <clears throat> Today, 33 institutions operate through this model, including some of the city's very best, the Metropolitan Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, the American Museum of Natural History, the New York Botanical Gardens, and the Bronx Zoo. The leaders of these cultural facilities call themselves the Cultural Institutions Group. According to the Department of Cultural Affairs, they're supposed to provide cultural services accessible to all New Yorkers. The trouble is, in many of these places, and I noted we're seeing it here locally with the uh, sad, uh, sadly struggling Albany Institute, they've tacked on recommended admission fees that are enormous in New York City at the Met, $25, even though technically, legally, they're not uh, allowed to um, mandate that that kind of charge be made. A lot of it has to do with foreign tourists getting them for all the money they can. I think the bottom line is that New York City, unlike the rest of the state, uh, which is prospering so much, sees the opportunity to make huge amounts of money through the cultural institutions, or the trustees of those institutions do, and so they're taking their opportunity. James Panera is joining us right now. He's the managing editor of the New Criterion. He writes often for the Wall Street Journal, and in this case, the Daily News. Good morning, James. Good to have you back with us. Good morning. Great to be here. Great to have you with us. You're out in Stanford, is that right? At the Hoover, Hoover Institution? What's that? Where, where are you right now? Out at Stanford? I'm in Stanford at the Hoover Institution. Yeah, that's what I was asking about. You're doing a little, uh, what, a week seminar on cultural issues? What brought you out to the West Coast? Well, basically, they have a media fellowship program that invites journalists and writers out uh, to meet the other fellows of the Hoover Institution. It's a, it's a great thing, and I'm, I'm deeply resentful of the weather they have out here. <laughs> I bet a lot of people are. Let's just talk about this phenomenon in New York City. I mean, how, you know, in a way, it's rooted in sort of a Jeffersonian concept, right? Jefferson believed that public buildings should be beautiful to ennoble respect for democracy, to give average people back then an opportunity to be surrounded by the beauty that maybe you have to be part of the court to experience in uh, Europe. Uh, there was a, a small d democratization emphasis that carried over to these uh, cultural institutions so that, as I would say, Andrew Carnegie's library, so that the masses had an opportunity to be exposed to beautiful things, be inspired by them, and who knows what that inspiration could lead to. Yet, in recent decades, that's been transformed in New York City to something much different. Why don't you, if you would, talk about the thesis of what you write about? Well, you're exactly right. I think in the 19th century, there was really this sense of the public good. And more recently, in, in our culture institutions, um, they've tried to become big businesses, even though they're nonprofits. Right. And in a way, big business is bad business when it comes to accessibility and really helping all New Yorkers. Um, as you mentioned in the opening of my piece, yeah, these institutions, the ones that are these public-private institutions, really do have a mandate uh, to serve all New Yorkers. And I feel that with their confusing ticketing policies, they're really not doing that sufficiently. Well, when I grew up in the Bronx in New York, I used to go to the Met all the time. It never occurred to me that you had to pay to go there. The kind of camel's nose under the tent, I guess, developed in the 60s with um, the initial fiscal problems that the city was having, and then it probably started spinning out a little bit out of control, maybe totally out of control, with the great fiscal uh, crisis of the mid-1970s. Can you give a thumbnail history of how this policy went from being open to the masses with city subsidies on city land to being as costly? as it is now. I mean, $25 to get into the Met, I mean, it's just ridiculous. No, you're absolutely right. Um, up to the 1960s, uh, the Metropolitan Museum, for example, was free. 
in the fiscal uh, crisis of the 70s, they, um, under Thomas Hovey, the director, they started the Institute of Policy called Pay What You Wish, But You Must Pay Something. And that was the sign on the door. Um, so there was a sense you had to pay something. And then they started to list what price that something should be. And from, let's say, 1992 to today, that price has gone from something like 8 or $10 to 25 So it's gone way ahead of inflation. What kind of money has, uh, say, the Met, which is a very good example since it's a world-famous, world-class museum, do you know what their annual revenues are? This must be uh, disclosed in their 990 uh, tax filings. Maybe they disclose it to the city as well. But what kind of, what is, it? is it a multi-billion dollar institution? It's probably close to it. I think it's close to it. I know that um, uh, they take... I looked at the 2011 returns that, um, you know, they depend on, uh, I think, over $20 million coming in from the city for, for that city taxpayer money supporting them. Uh, they also sit in, uh, in, uh, on city land. They, the, the building is owned by the city. They pay no rent on that. And so they do benefit even more than a nonprofit like like the Met, um, like MoMA, which is a purely private nonprofit. That's the Museum of Modern Art. That's not in this class, right? Um Yes, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just uh, for people who didn't know what MoMA was, I was just saying it's a museum of modern art, which is really a private museum, so it's not in the same category. Correct, and I, and I, you know, I think when um, a museum like the Metropolitan becomes dependent on their ticketing revenue, it really doesn't serve anybody. They be, they behave more like an entertainment venue, uh, putting on shows that are just going to attract the most number of people, and not putting on the shows they really should be putting on to service all New Yorkers. In terms of the Met, do you know what their salary scales are? I would think. I mean, it is a very prestigious uh, museum. There's no question about it. World class. But have you seen, uh, when you looked at the 990s, what they're paying their top people, one of whom, Harold Holzer, who's a recognized uh, Lincoln scholar, uh, certainly has strong ties to uh, uh, Governor Mar uh, former Governor Mario Cuomo and ties to the current Governor Andrew Cuomo. Do you recall what, they, what kind of level of salaries they're paying? Well, I mean, I, I just want to say that, you know, I, I'm friends with many people at the Met. I love the Met. And sure. this is not um, an indictment of them in particular. Right. Uh, it's more that I think they have a problem on their hands, and I wish they'd face up to it. Uh, you know, the directors of these institutions, of MoMA, the Met, uh, can earn almost or exceeding at times a million dollars a year. So when you're making that much money, you know, you may lose sight of what it's like to earn much less than that and have to pay $25 per person to get your family in. Yeah, you may lose sight, too, of the fact that, say, out in the Bronx or in Brooklyn, there may be some uh, Dominican or Puerto Rican or African uh, young people who don't have a lot of money who might uh, really be um, benefited by seeing what's at the Met and being able to get in there regularly, as opposed to, say, German or Japanese tourists who, for whom $25 with their uh, euro exchange or yen exchange may not be any big deal at all. I mean, are they, in fact, focused, uh, because you do suggest this, on uh, the massive number of tourists who keep pouring into New York City with their strong exchanges. Well, I think that's why they make it obscure, because they want the tourists to pay uh, full freight. And so um, that's one reason the sign is oh, that says recommended uh, or suggested admission is only in English. It's in very small print. And so it's very hard to figure out if you're not someone who's already kind of in the cultural elite and you're a native English speaker. Actually, the story came out of a conversation I had uh, with a family friend who uh, lives in Washington Heights, and she's not a native English speaker, and she wished she could take her daughters and sons to the Met, but um, didn't think she could afford it. Huh. I think the Met should do a lot of outreach in these communities uh, in the Bronx, a you know, in Washington Heights, to let them know that the, their institution's open to them. James, do you know what the law is on, what is the legal contract, uh, contractual obligation of institutions like uh, the Met in terms of making admission available for free? Do they have a legal obligation to do that under the terms of their agreement with the city? Well, there is language in their original 19th century charters. Now, actually, this language is being tested right now. There are, last count, at least two lawsuits um, that are being filed against the Met for what they claim to be deceptive ticketing practices. So we may find out what the law is. Now, I think it hasn't been fully tested recently. What would happen if you had walked in or if I went down there and just walked in the door? Do you know what they do if you try to just walk in and pass? I guess there's a ticket counter. I've done it. They will say you, could, you have to pay. So, you know, but you have to pay to get in. They say you have to pay. Hmm. If you give them a penny, they will give you a ticket. 
But, um, you know, there was, uh, I think, a story in the New York Post uh, just the other day about uh, what sounds like a whistleblower at the Met who was saying that uh, when he was working there, he was encouraged to um, make sure people paid full freight and yep. to give people a hard time when they did. Do you know what the so practice? That's true, that's and, do you know what the practice is uh, like? If it's similar at the um, Museum of Natural History or at the Bronx Zoo or at the Botanical Gardens, all ha- former haunts of mine. Well, they all have slightly different different policies, and all you know, frankly, very hard to figure out. I mean, for my story, I, I did a lot of research, and you really have to read the fine print to know what they offer. Um, the, uh, the American Museum of Natural History has a very similar ticketing policy to the Met, but they also have special exhibits that they charge extra for, and those are mandatory charges. The same goes for the Botanical Garden, where everything there is almost a special exhibit. So if you want to see anything, aside from just walking on the pavement, you need to pay $25. I think there was a time, and I'll let you go with uh, just your answer to this one, there was a time in New York when uh, newspapers and other news organizations would have made a crusade out of keeping these institutions open to the public, open to poorer people, so that there could be a small d democratization effect of uh, having that be the case, but that doesn't uh, seem to be the case these days, although I give the Post credit. I'm glad you mentioned the story that we had just a few days ago about uh, whistleblower on the inside, but you don't hear Mayor Bloomberg uh, speak very often about this. I would think single-handedly he could probably underwrite uh, open admissions uh, or uh, open access to the Museum of Metropolitan Metropolitan Museum if he wanted to. Uh, I I think the money is just so seductive that no one wants to uh, tip the apple cart over but you make a good point. There are donors. There was a donor who gave money to the Bronx Museum to make sure it stayed free until 2015. Things like this can happen. Donors can put restrictions on their money and say, we want to make sure there's enough outreach to so that all New Yorkers can get into these institutions. Well, James Finero, if people want to read your article, they can do so uh, just by going to the Daily News yesterday. And if they want to keep up with your blogs, let's give your um, website a plug again, because I know that you're regularly uh, doing some blogging uh, for the uh, new Criterion. That's right, newcriterion.com. Well, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Good luck out at uh, Stanford. I'm sure you'll have a great time. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Okay, appreciate you joining us. James Finero is the managing editor of the New Criterion uh, magazine, a uh, magazine that focuses a very erudite way on uh, cultural issues and strongly recommended. If you have the interest, you can check it out online. At, uh, I think it's new, just newcriterion.com, but you can easily search it and find out and see if it's the kind of magazine you'd be interested in. And you can subscribe online as well as in uh, hard copy if you want to. This is Fred Dicker. We're live at the State Capitol. If John Kowalski is ready, we'll take a break and be right back.